morning, folks. Uh, we are going to do a re-record of Sunday service, just bits and bobs, because we had some gremlins in the works. These things happen. We have worked all out now, so we're all okay. And this morning, we have a really important message about taking Jesus' message seriously. And, and I just felt that we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to miss out on that. So we're hoping that if you couldn't listen on Sunday, you'd love to... to to get into the message and get into the, the time of worship that we're having together. So yeah, we hope you enjoy. It's a delight to have you with us. God bless. And here's to when we can meet face to face. Good morning. When Keith asked me to light the candle this morning and tell you a little bit about what God had done in my life, I could be forgiven for thinking that God hadn't done much in the last couple of months for me. However, I could not be more wrong. As most of you will know, I contracted COVID at the start of January, and it's been a really rough couple of months. But throughout all of this, my trust in God did not waver. I contracted COVID at a time where work was quieter for me. I couldn't run my toddler group. I couldn't open the cafe. I couldn't do the things that I would normally be doing throughout the week. And so if I was going to get it at any time, now was the time to get it. And God had that in his hands. Throughout my journey of being at St John's and Kings Park Church and latterly at Newton, God has surrounded me with people who care, who love me and who've been supportive in so many ways. I've had phone calls, I've had text messages, I've had cards, I've had flowers, we've had meals delivered and just amazing support from family, friends and church family round about us. And I know that that's God putting a whole lot of people in my life that, that care and, and want to help our family through a difficult time. So I'm so grateful that if I was going to get it, I've got it now and that I have so many amazing people in my life and that is God definitely telling me that I'm loved and that I'm part of something really special. So we light this candle this morning to say thank you and also to remind us that God is the light of the life and the light of our world and in him there is no darkness. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise you could ever bring, worthy of every breath you could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath you could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song you could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise you could ever bring. Worthy of every breath you could ever breathe, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever see. Worthy of every breath you could ever breathe. 
can ever live, live for you, oh, live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, nothing in the sight you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will build my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me. Who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, desperate for you, desperate for you. I surrender. Drench my soul as mercy and grace are for I hunger and thirst. I hunger and thirst. I'm stretched wide, I know you hear my cry, speak to me now, speak to me now, I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you Jesus.
Jesus, please with him. Lord of your way, Lord of your way, and be like a mighty storm. Stay within my soul, Lord of your way, Lord of your way, and be like a rushing wind Jesus breathe within Lord of your way Lord of your way in me like a mighty storm stay within my soul Lord of your way Lord of your way in me I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you more, I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know I surrender. Hi there, how's it going for you all? All the snow has gone now, but I'm sure you enjoyed some sledging and had lots of fun building some snowmen and throwing snowballs. For some of you, it won't be long now before you go back to school and you'll be able to see some of your friends again. It's been hard, hasn't it, not to be able to see and play with your friends at school. And we've missed not only our friends, but also some of our family that we've not been able to visit and to be able to give them a big hug. Perhaps your granny or your granddad, your aunties or your uncles, your cousins and other members of your family. Well, I've found a book with a story all about that. I think you'll like it. It's called While We Can't Hug. And it's all about two best friends, Hedgehog and Tortoise. And they really wanted to give each other a big hug. But they weren't allowed. Well, they're looking a bit sad, aren't they? Well, their friend suddenly arrived, another friend. He was called Owl. And Owl said, don't worry. There's lots of other ways that you can show someone that you love them. Well, let's see how they did that. Well, first of all, Hedgehog... He waved over to Tortoise and that made Tortoise smile. Come on, give a wee wave. When someone waves at you, you just want to wave back, don't you? It cheers you up and it makes you smile. Well, Tortoise thought, what can I do? Well, Tortoise made a funny face and that made Hedgehog laugh. It's good to make someone laugh. It makes them feel good about themselves, doesn't it? Well, Hedgehog had another idea. I know, I could write a letter to Tortoise. And what did Tortoise do? He wrote a letter back. I love to get a letter or a card. It makes you feel really special that someone is thinking about you. Well, there was more ideas to come. What did Tortoise do next? Well, he did a little dance. So he did, he did a little dance and Hedgehog, he joined in. Who likes to dance? It's great fun, isn't it? And it's good exercise as well. And then Hedgehog had another idea. I think you like this one. He blew a kiss over 
to Tortoise. And Tortoise saw it and he caught it and he kept it. And then what did he do? He sent three kisses back again. I wonder if you've ever done that. You know, some people have had to do that recently through a window because they've not been able to visit properly. But thankfully, they've been able to let the other person know how much they love them and miss them. They are very special kisses, those, aren't they? Well, I wonder what's coming next. I really love this one. Tortoise sang a song and Hedgehog played along. And you know, even although we can't all be together on a Sunday just now in church, we can still enjoy and join in where we are with the worship songs. Isn't that great? Well, do you think they're running out of ideas? Well, here's another one to show that they loved and cared for each other. They both painted pictures so everyone would know that they are friends. And friends, they sometimes like doing the same things together, don't they? I'm sure you do with your friends. But good friends aren't just friends in the good and happy times, but also when things aren't so good. When they're feeling a bit sad or a bit down. And for some of us, it can feel a bit like that just now. But we can still be looking out for each other, just like Tortoise and Hedgehog in the story, because the happy times will come again. Now, they couldn't hug each other, but they both knew that they were loved and they cared for one another. And this story reminds me of some of the things that Jesus said in the Bible and some of the ways that he showed people how much God loved them and also how he wanted us to show his love to other people. In the New Testament, in the book of John, chapter 15, Jesus told his best friends, the disciples, that just as God had loved him, so he loved them, and that they were to love and care for one another. And that when they did this, people would know that they were his followers. So how did Jesus show his love for other people? Well, it tells us in the Bible that he showed kindness and love to people that nobody else loved or wanted to be friends with. And I'm sure you've read or heard of the story of Zacchaeus. He became a friend of Jesus, as well as being kind to others. Jesus loved people who were lonely and people who were afraid. And you may again have heard of the story of the lady who went to the well all by herself to get some water. She discovered how much God loved her. And so she went and told everyone in her village. Jesus also loved people when they needed help. He gave them food when they were hungry. He helped and healed people when they were sick. He told them about God and how much he loved them and wanted to know them and not only be their friend, but also that God would send his son Jesus to be their saviour the kind of friend who would love them always in the sad times as well as the happy times. Jesus showed his love by praying for his friends, his disciples, as well as teaching them how to pray to God. And this is a prayer that we still pray today in church. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And so Jesus showed us lots of ways that he loved and cared for people. And although we can't give hugs to some of those we love just now, there are lots of other ways that we can show that we still love them. We can pray for them. We can let them know that we're thinking of them and missing them. Perhaps in the letter or the card that we saw in the story, we could send them one or in a phone call or an email. 
Perhaps you can think of other ways that you could help to cheer someone up and make them feel special and good about themselves. We're so thankful, aren't we, that Jesus is always there for us and has promised never to leave us. He will always be our friend. Let's pray together. Hands out, hands up and hands down. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're not only our wonderful friend, but also our loving saviour. Thank you that you've promised to always be with us and never leave us in the good times as well as the sad. We thank you especially for our families and friends and pray that you will watch over each one of them and keep them safe. Lord Jesus, help us to keep growing stronger in you, trusting in you more each day and show us ways that we can love others as you love us. We look forward to the time when we can all be together again. And in your name we pray. Amen. Standing with my hands held high, the valley will never take my song. Find me in the desert, holding on to you for me. The desert will never take my song. Oh, the desert will never take my song. And I will praise you, I will praise you, I won't let the stones cry, I won't let the stones cry out, and I will praise you, something in me has to, I won't let the stones cry, I won't let the stones cry out. Find me in the comments, hands in the prophecy, still shouting for everything you've done. High up on the mountain, I was made to test it forever. You are my son, oh, forever. I won't let 
Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity of worship and for the freedom to be amongst your family today. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, make us aware of your presence wherever we are this morning. Lord, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for all that you've allowed into our life this past year, the good along with the difficult things, which have reminded us how much we need you and rely on your presence filling us every single day. Lord, thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hearts and fears that trouble us and leave them there knowing your strength and assurance are all that we require. Lord, we pray for your spirit to lead us each step of this coming year, whatever trials it may bring. We ask that you will guide our decisions and turn our hearts to desire you above all else. We ask that you will open doors needing to be opened and close the ones needing to be shut tight. We ask for your help to pursue you first above every dream and desire you've put within our hearts. Heavenly Father, you are a loving and forgiving God and have great patience when we wander far from you. You welcome us home to you when we stray. How can we not offer you our lives in willing service wherever you might place us? Lord, you loved us so much you gave us your son, Jesus, whose incredible sacrifice gave us freedom and life. Father, forgive us for the times we've worked so hard to be self-sufficient, forgetting our need for you, living independent of your spirit. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our minds and for allowing pride and selfishness wreak havoc over our lives. Forgive us for not following your ways and for living distant from your presence. We confess our need for you. We ask that you make all things new in our hearts, in our minds and in our lives in this coming year. Lord, as we are about to enter the season of Lent, let it be a time for inward searching that makes us more able to look with compassion at the needs of the world. Let us say the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we come to our next message, our next item of, of business, if you like, on the Growing Young, Growing with Jesus series that we're doing as a church as a whole, across the house groups, across, across the sermons for this next few weeks. We're taking Jesus' message seriously today. That's where we are this morning. And we want to think about how that helps us grow with Jesus, but also how it helps us grow young. But first, of course, we always start with a joke, and we like to just ease you into the message. And so this is the joke for this morning. A man went to the doctor with, with stomach problems. He, he was having real kind of problems. And the doctor asked him what his diet was, and the man said, well, I only eat pool balls. The doctor looked at him and went, pool balls? What do you mean? And he said, yes, I, I only eat red ones for breakfast. I have yellow and orange ones for lunch. I have blue for an afternoon snack and then purple and black for dinner. Straight away the doctor says, ah, I see the problem. You're not eating enough greens. We don't like it, do we, when we go to the doctor and he tells us we need to change the way that we're living. I think when we come to Jesus, sometimes, for me especially, when he comes to me and speaks to me, often I am challenged and nudged to go back to what he has said and what he is saying. And that does mean that sometimes I have to change my life. As a church, we are here to know Jesus and to make him known. This is about discipleship and evangelism. We want to be a community centered around Jesus. We want to be a community that welcomes all without judgment and points them to Jesus and to come to Jesus 
and to listen to his message truthfully as the Bible reveals it. Jesus is our message and people are our heart. But the problem for many today, you and I included, is that we have a religion that Jesus is not at the heart of it, that actually our, our faith, our religion, is, is dominated by just almost being nice about doing good things and hoping that will return to us. The, the, the researchers, the theologians, call this the religion of MTD. And the religion MTD is something that puts young people off, folks who are young who've experienced it think they don't want any of Jesus because of this MTD. Well, I hear you asking, what is MTD? It is moralistic therapeutic deism. That's the, the big technical name. But basically, moralistic, you have to do good things. Therapeutic, if you do good things, you'll feel better. And deism, God's involved, but he's not really involved. God is there in the world around us. We believe that God is there, but he's not really involved in our lives. If you like, God is seen as some sort of heavenly butler to provide all the good things for us in life and actually not mention in Jesus. But then you could also throw in the golden rule gospel. The golden rule gospel, which is Luke 6, verse 31. Do unto others what you would have done to you. Do good things and good things will come to you. And interestingly, both of these are toxic to faith. It's all about right living, doing the right thing, than actually right believing. We make God an ice cream seller who does some sort of hocus pocus that gives us exactly what we want at that time. And when he doesn't give us that, we reject him. This is not the God that's revealed in the Bible. This is not the God who is the Father of Jesus Christ. This is not the Father of the Trinity. So let's look at Jesus' call. Jesus' call reveals so much. As he calls his disciples and as he begins his ministry, he's speaking into our hearts today as well. So we read from Mark chapter 1, verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. He was baptized by John in the Jordan, and just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, with whom I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is his first and enduring message of his ministry. Repent and believe. Turn back to God and believe what he's doing. Believe the good news. Believe the good news of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. So we see Jesus, we see Jesus coming. We see the Father sending the Spirit upon him and speaking words of truth and hope over him. Then he's sent into the wilderness for 40 days. He, he, he is tempted by Satan. He's ministered to by the angels. And then, then he comes and he is right into his ministry. And he's calling out to the people, repent and believe. And he calls his disciples to follow him. I always feel sorry for their father Zebedee, who's left in the boat with a hired man as, as James and John leave. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough gig, but sometimes that's what Jesus calls us to do. That when he calls us to follow, that we're called to leave everything else and follow him. It's not that he, he won't give us 
He won't backfill, if you like, the stuff that we need. Maybe he won't. But Jesus, as he calls us to follow, desires us to put him first. To put him first. And there is the challenge. The challenge to put him first when he says, follow me and drop in everything else so that you're fulfilling your ministry as he calls you. I think we need to make some changes in how we disciple and tell others about Jesus. Jesus is compelling. Christianity is bland. Jesus is radical and challenging. Christianity can be off-putting, or it can be very nice, but it can also be kind of repellent. So what do we do? As Christian brothers and sisters, as we're trying to follow Jesus, and if we are folks beginning the journey, what do we do? Well, we, we focus more on Jesus than abstract beliefs. We focus more on Jesus than traditions, that we see Jesus at the center of the story of God, and that actually we're all part of that same story. Jesus makes sense of this Bible. As you look from beginning to end, it is the story of Jesus. And it's the story of God's redemption plan for the world. We need to see that in the Bible there is an unlikely clan full of people who make mistakes and fall down in sin. And that we are part of that clan. We are on that journey together. And if we want to connect with all ages, but especially with the next generation, we need to recognize that salvation is not just for eternity, but it is for the here and now. That we can be transformed in the here and now to be more like Jesus. And to be more like Jesus makes us better as the people we are. And who of us doesn't want to become a better version of us? The gospel is for every part of life. It's not some sort of transaction. It's not saying a simple prayer and then that's it done. We're in heaven. Salvation is about every part of life. The gospel is about a new way of life that has present as well as eternal implications. We're not just being saved for heaven. We want to make a difference in the here and now. We want to be the good news for Dalkeith. And that's something that young people respond to. They don't want to just go through the motions. They want to be challenged. And they're desperate to make a difference in their lives. And the church has a role to play. You and I have a role to play. Everyone gets to play. It's not like that game when you're picked last or you're left on the bench and you don't get a game. Every one of us gets to play. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks about how we are a body, that we are a body built up under Jesus and every part of us has a function and a role. And look to Jesus. If we want to be serious about taking Jesus' message seriously, we need to look to Jesus. We need to read about Jesus. We need to pray to Jesus. We need to let Jesus speak to us. We need to recognize that sometimes his message is tough. When he calls us to follow, he also says that we are to take up our cross daily. Jesus took up his cross and he died. So when we take up our cross, we are dying to ourselves for his glory. Jesus' message is not about fire insurance. It's not about scraping over the line. It's not about allowing Jesus to be some sort of middle-class, suburban hero. But it's about taking his message seriously and recognizing that he calls us into tough places. It's also recognizing that we will suffer. It's also recognizing that Jesus suffered. And as Jesus suffered and died, we may have to suffer and die in whatever way that looks. But it means that we're taking the message seriously and other people will see it and other people will want to know more. As we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we do discover that Jesus has some tough things to say 
and he calls us to follow into the hard places that he went. Jackie Pullinger went to Hong Kong to work in the walled city as a 22-year-old. And there was an interview a couple of weeks back where she spoke of how Jesus says that we are to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. I quite like that. It's not about safety. It's not about feeling better about ourselves. This journey with Jesus is about helping the lost be found. There was a story of a, a, a student, Ian, who took his Bible to school and another kid saw the Bible and nicked it off him and said, I'm going to burn this Bible. And Ian didn't, didn't lose his temper. He just said, well, what is it that you believe in that you would feel that you wanted to do that? And when he asked him that straightforward question, the kid got annoyed. He got angry. He chucked his Bible back to him and, and stormed off. But it's interesting that, that sometimes we, we step back from just asking a pertinent or probing question to help other people discover what Jesus means to them. And sometimes we do just need to do that. We need to be open and ask people questions. To take time to listen, but just to ask, well, what do you think? What do you believe? and see what happens. Because if we're honest and open, and then if we're honest and open about our own struggles and our own doubts, then people respond. It's amazing how if we are honest and open, that we want to share about how we have joy and contentment, then people want to know more. Because Jesus is not about being moralistic or being therapeutic or, or having deism or even the golden rule gospel. Having Jesus is finding that he feeds our souls. And as we find that bread of life, we point others who are starving to the bread of life. So what does this mean for us as church? Well, I think from all our ministries, from, from our children's ministry to our teen ministry to our house groups to the sermons, the messages on a Sunday, we need to always talk about Jesus and to let people ask questions, to let people be open about doubts and struggles and know that we don't have all the answers. Young people want to speak about their doubts and that's okay. It's good to speak about doubts because Doubt isn't toxic to faith. Silence is toxic to faith. Be honest and open about your own struggles and let other people be honest and open about their struggles too as they walk with Jesus. Soren Kierkegaard once said, how can a person who's already a Christian become a Christian? Now, what was he meaning about this? Well, he was saying, how can a person who's already been part of a church and grown up in it all, how can he become a Christian? To those who have grown up in church that have a second-hand faith. And some of us have, have, have been there. Maybe we are there still. We've just grown up in it all, or we've, we've kind of been grafted in, and we've not really thought about it much lately. We just tend to go through the motions. We want to grow as Christians. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to be transformed by him. And that means that we have to listen to him and take his message seriously. And also to do that, we need to listen to others to help them grow, to meet with Jesus afresh and anew. Welcome questions. Help people develop a thinking faith. This is the joy of Alpha. We run Alpha, we're running Alpha just now online. And the joy of it is that, that you're encouraged to just ask questions and not give answers. Because when you give answers, you sometimes close people down. Let people explore their faith. Speak about Jesus, speak about the work of the Holy Spirit. And if they ask you of your faith, you're like a witness at the court. You tell what you've seen. 
I wonder, does our language in the church always come back to Jesus? Does our language with, does our language with each other focus on Jesus? Do we talk about the main mundane stuff or do we want to bring Jesus into every conversation? We want to show in our lives that we're obedient to Jesus, that we follow him. We're obedient not so that we can somehow earn our way to heaven, but we're obedient because of the grace that flows to us we want to trust and obey through gratitude. So we want to live the life, we want to speak the life of Jesus. We want to be prepared for the tough times because it is not always easy. The Christian walk is not meant to be all rainbows and unicorns. The Christian walk is through suffering, through that dark valley, yet we walk through it with the one who's been there and he will lead us through and he will give us the joy and the peace and the contentment that we need. Salvation I think is a journey. Salvation is a journey. If you look at the two kind of salvation differences in the New Testament, you've got Paul who's on the road to Damascus, bam, God met with him, he was changed forever. It was like a total turnaround, and that happens, but it's maybe not as, as common as maybe we put emphasis on. If we look at Peter, if we look at, in fact, all the disciples, we will see that their salvation was a journey. Peter fell down many times, yet he got up, and Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. And for you and I, salvation is a journey. There will be many times when we fall, there will be many times where we make mistakes, we sin, we fall short. But the strength comes to help us to stand again and to walk again. And I wonder, where are you in this journey? Young people respond if you share honestly with integrity. You are like a midwife when it comes to faith questions. Other people have questions about the message of Jesus, but you have to let them work it out, and you're there to help them push on. Being a disciple of Jesus, knowing who to believe in, and how we live it up, and refusing to give up is what it's all about, and also refusing to give up on others, as God never refuses to give up. God refuses to give up on you. All of this is about Jesus, about taking him seriously when he says, follow me, and knowing that sometimes things will be hard. It's not easy, but in it all, like Paul when he was in chains in prison, he can say, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. In other words, in the toughest times, we can keep on going. He will fill us with joy. He will fill us with contentment. And that is the good news, that he never gives up on us and that he gives us a peace that the world cannot understand. In closing, I was listening to Francis Chan, a pastor across in America, and Francis was speaking about how our lives should demand an explanation. And I've really been challenged by that. Am I living a life that demands an explanation for the way that I live? As Christians, we all should be living a life that demands an explanation. That people will ask us, why are you doing that? How are you living that way? Why are you doing it that way and not this way? so that we can explain the good news, so that we can explain the love and the trust that we have in Jesus Christ. We want, we want to live lives that demand an explanation so that others will hear the good news and that their lives will be transformed and that God's kingdom will come. So we invite you to take the message of Jesus seriously.
Soak in his word. Soak in the Bible. Read a gospel this week. Spend time in prayer, listening to what he has to say. Take serious the message of Jesus. Look at his life. Keep him as your focus. May he be our church's focus in all that we do. Let us never take our eyes off him. He is calling us to follow him, to pick up our cross daily. This is what salvation is. Joy, peace, contentment in the midst of suffering, in the midst of good times, in all things we can do through Christ Jesus who gives us strength. We can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives us strength. For us, for our children, for our children's children, and for our children's children's children, may we, may we help spread the message of Jesus as we take it seriously in you. Let us pray. Father God, I just pray that as we look to Jesus, as we see what he has done for us, and as we hear his words as he speaks to us, Lord, that we will take it seriously, that we will allow you, we will allow you in to do a work in us to set your people free. So as you work in us, Lord, I pray that you will do amazing things through us for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, as a bilingual Latina, what's most comforting about that is that Jesus is spelled the same in English and in Spanish, the only difference being that there is a tilde on the U when you write it down in Spanish. As a pastor to Latina and bilingual students, it's become an important thing to unpack together because when we talk about the message of Jesus and taking it seriously, we often talk about the stories of Jesus, the theology of Jesus, the message that Jesus had and we have to take it seriously. But who embodied that message, who lived that message is also important. So as a pastor and a preacher and a leader, it's become really important for me to actually unpack Jesus's gender, his skin color, where he lived, the profession of those that surrounded him, the lands that he walked in. And for our young people and young adults, this has made a difference in the way that they approach who Jesus is and what the message is all about. In one particular conversation, I got a text from one of our young adults and they said, hey, there's this movie I've been really wanting to watch. Could you come with me and then have a conversation with me after? I said, yeah, that just sounds like fun. So we went and watched the movie together. And then after, I really thought we were gonna be talking about dating and boys and relationship because it was a romantic movie, a romantic comedy movie. Little did I know that I sat down for pizza with this student for quite a long time and her questions were about race and ethnicity and how is it that we relate to one another based on what Jesus had taught us to do. Later on, as we continued to unpack, she said, you know, it became apparent for me for the first time that I had something in common with the savior of the world, that my skin color too matters, that the lands and the borders that I've crossed also matter, that the people whose company I am with matters. And so for those of us that are preaching in multicultural and bilingual, and for me in particular, Latina context, unpacking the person of Jesus makes the message even that more invigorating, makes the message even more exciting, makes the message actually have a punch for what I do every day, for who I talk to, and can even mean holy conversations after watching romantic comedies with a 20-something-year-old outside a theater over pizza. For those students who are also in the dominant culture, it is also an opportunity to begin to unravel and unpack some of the things that we have attached to Jesus' message that is not really a part of the gospel message. It's an invitation to come and meet this Jesus, who is not just this faraway person, 
but as somebody who walks with them as they go to school, as they encounter parents, as they encounter family members, as they encounter all the realities that they have to navigate. So when we talk about Jesus and the message that Jesus had, we have to talk about the person who embodied the message so that the message could have the punch and the gravitas that the good news brings to all people. Let us pray for others and ourselves. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us comfort and helping us through the past year as we become aware of all those who have been affected in some way by COVID-19. The lonely, those that are sad, and those who feel that no one cares. For those who have lost loved ones, lost their jobs, their homes, and sometimes their whole families. Father God, we pray that you will draw near to them and comfort them and give them hope. Father God, we pray for our children from nursery age who are being deprived of contact with other children, to all school children who are missing out on their education, and our older generation who are missing out on their university education, apprenticeships and all their college courses. Father, we pray they will get all the help they need in order to fulfill their earlier promise. The children are our future. We pray that a safe, normal life can resume for them sooner rather than later. Father, we pray for the protection of our families and friends, for our minister and for all those who make our church such a welcoming place despite all the restrictions. We pray for all the charity workers and all those who give their time freely for the benefit of others. Let their generosity not be wasted. Instead, let this pandemic be the way to a spiritual renewal. Father God, we pray for all those in care who are being deprived of physical contact with their loved ones. We lift them up to you today. Bless them, heal them, keep them safe until the time comes when hugs will be back on the menu. Lord, we pray that you'll give strength and endurance to all those involved in the NHS and all those in our public services, such as the police and the fire brigade, who daily are faced with difficult and stressful situations. We ask that you will guide them and be with them every day as each new challenge presents itself. Father, we pray for Christians throughout the world who are being persecuted for their beliefs. Grant them strength, courage and protection from those who seek to harm them. Lord, we are aware of the difficult decisions that are being made, not only by our politicians and scientists, but also those across the world. We pray that you will give them wisdom and understanding to make the right decisions that will benefit us all. Lord, we rejoice that vaccines have been discovered and once administered will help us eliminate COVID-19 and will allow us to look forward to a healthier future. Father God, help us to be great givers. Help us to be generous and kind. Help us to look to the needs of others and not be consumed only by our own. May the fruits of your spirit be evident in our lives. Your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Let us now take a moment to remember those we hold dear. Lord, speak your blessing on all those who are hurting today and give them hope and grant them peace. Help them to put their trust in you and we pray they will seek you first above all else. Let them know there is light at the end of even the darkest tunnel. Heavenly Father, in the days ahead, let us remember and take comfort in the words of Hebrews 13, verse 5. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In the Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So we go from this place, knowing that Jesus has given his all for each one of us, as he gave for us. What more can we do than give for him? May we seek his presence. May we recognize the cost. May we live in relationship with him and with each other. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all those whom you love for this day and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.